pressure. It affects us in all sorts of ways in all parts of our life. When we're driving, driving along and suddenly someone does something to you and suddenly the pressure builds up and you make bad decisions. But not only on the road, everywhere in life we see how pressure affects us. So it's not just in the car that pressure affects us. Pressure affects us both physically and mentally and in all parts of our life. How does pressure affect us? It's because of our emotional control. Our emotions can go up and down and where we are emotionally really affects how we make those decisions and how it affects our body as well. Thanks for joining us on this week's show. With the Olympics now in full swing, those athletes are going to be under enormous pressure. Once every four years they get the chance to bring home the gold for their country. So our theme, obviously, pressure. We're going to take a look at one of the greatest ever comebacks, which also means it was one of the greatest ever chokes in table tennis history, and examine what happened in that match. Plus, we'll have all the usual segments, the tip of the week, drill of the week, remember when. It's going to be a great show. Stay with us. It was 2005, the World Singles Championships. Michael Mays v. Hao Shui from China. Big match. Michael Mays had already beaten Wang Hao and was on a roll. And the Chinese were obviously worried about the great Michael Mays. So the match is set up now. It got to a stage where Hao Shui had played well. He was now three games to nil. Seven points to three. Three nil, seven three up. Surely, if you look at that scoreboard, you think it's basically all over. But no, Michael Mays wasn't done with yet. And how Shui started to feel the pressure. So seven three now, how Shui makes a simple flick into Mays' middle. Mays misses that top spin. Hao Shui gets pretty excited. You can see there that he's overly excited and the bench at the back jumps up. And that is a telltale sign. That backhand simple return error off the side is a real telltale sign that Hao Shui is starting to feel the pressure. Mays goes to serve, looks up, and realizes that Haushaway's coach has called a timeout. What would he be thinking during the timeout? He'd hopefully be just trying to calm him down, but he'd also be giving him a few tactics. He's telling him there, move that ball around from side to side. And at 7-4, a really simple error again, just pushing that ball off the end. Did that timeout work? For me, in that point, definitely not. He's pushed it straight off the end. Mays' coach looking much more nervous than Mays himself. So there you are, a simple error that time from the return by Mays. And then a good ball there by Haushui. He moves around well, the coach pretty excited there. Moves around, gets that forehand attack in and goes 
to a, a bigger lead. And now he's made a good return here, but there you see he's missed that high ball. He's trying to blame the lights, but the real problem is that he hasn't moved well to this ball. Have a look at the, the movement here. So he moves into that one, but watch this foot movement here. Doesn't move well, he doesn't jump into position and gets caught out. And then he's got him back again and missing a smash. Have a look at that little smirk on his face. That's not a smile of happiness. That is a smile saying, I'm a bit nervous. So 9-7. How shall I serving? Let's have a look at what serve he does here. So the serve does go long. Mays gets a play on it, but just clips the net and uh, the ball goes long. So definitely not where he wants to be serving, long to Mays' forehand. So 10-7 now. Hashway three match points and a let, building up the pressure. This is a chance to get to the semi-final of the World Singles Championship. Good serve, got a high return, but makes a mistake. Have a look at Hashaway there. Goes to his towel. You can see that he's just really uh, at all, um, all at sea. He just doesn't know what to think now. Missing such a simple ball to take the match. Great block, gets him back again. So he's played well in the rally to here, but let's watch his feet once more. Look at that. And the coach just, he doesn't know what to think anymore. He's thinking, how can you miss that, Haushaway? Haushaway's thinking the same. But you can see the worried look on his face. You can see him just touching his left shoulder all the time. To me, that's a sign of a little bit of tightness in the left shoulder. 9-10. And he's got... Mays on the ground, just had to put that ball on the table for the match. And you can see him berating himself. He knows that he's just let, let a very big opportunity slip. So Mays, looking pretty calm, just pointing to the moisture on the ground, saying, uh, come and wipe that up, please. So 10 all. Can Houshway recover from this? Again, a simple backhand flick error. Look at, look at the uh, coach for uh, Michael Mays. He's sitting there, he's in a frozen position. He's in a good position for himself. He knows that if he moves, Mays is going to lose. 11-10, game point now. And again, a forehand opportunity, a forehand error, and Mays takes the game 12-10, now three games to one, and he's got himself back into this quarterfinal. So Mays, incredibly from there, gets himself back three all, and now at 10-5, has a five match points of his own. Let's have a look at Mays there. Still looking pretty calm. A big difference to what we saw from Hao Shui when he had all those match points. And his coach still hasn't moved. So now, 10-6, four match points. You can see Mays pretty calm. And even after he wins that last point, still emotionally under control. But then, let's have a look at what happens. So he's really kept his emotions in check this whole match. 
A real difference to Hao Shui that we saw in that fourth game. Emotionally, he was really high. He was up there and let it slip. But have a look at Mays, had bottled it all in and now allows himself to celebrate after the victory has been made. So Alois, that was called the greatest comeback ever. But if you flip that round, maybe you can call that the greatest choke ever. Yeah, it was pretty big, wasn't it? I mean, uh, I think just this, the whole situation, you know, quarter final of the men's singles, um, Mays had already beaten Wang Hao, so the Chinese were very wary of him st straight up. Yeah, so and in China, the World Championships, yeah. Hao Shui probably expected to win, maybe. Yeah, definitely he was expected to win. He was definitely the favourite for that match. Young Chinese player in front of his home crowd. And like you said, when you're up, you know, 3-0, 7-3, you'd think it's a pretty uh, relatively easy win from that point, but something just happened. It's funny how your mind can play tricks on you. Yeah, and, and you know, emotions are so important in table tennis as we, as we see. So at 7-3, 3-0, yeah, if you walked into the stadium or if you were looking at it from outside, you'd think... Simple situation, but being in that situation of 7-3 up and, um, you know, you're, you're, you're right there, you've got all that pressure building on you. It's... Playing for a semi-final berth and Hauschwey just made a lot of simple errors, seemed to miss a lot of smashes, which, you know, for a player of his standard, he would, you know, miss one in a thousand of those smashes. Yeah, I mean, Mays is a great lobber. Don't, 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 oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Good, don't good forget that. Good depth on that, wasn't on yeah, some of those abs lobs. Absolutely, but, yeah. But what about, he missed an easy forehand also off a high serve, and then Mays was on the floor on one of those points. All he had to do was put it on, and he would have been into the semi-finals. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're, those two points, I think, for me, are the real cr uh, critical ones. He made a great little short topspin serve. Mays popped it up close to the net and, you know, 99 times out of 100, he wins that point. Yeah. Yeah, incredible circumstances. So pressure, it can really play tricks on you. Um, I'm sure you've been in situations where you felt pressure and it's affected your decision making. So, um, yeah, just try and, you know, notice when you get into those situations so then you can put some steps in place to get yourself back into a good frame of mind where you can play your best table tennis. A really big thank you to the ITTF for letting us show footage from that match. You can see more of that video on their YouTube channel. We'll put a link in our show notes both to that specific video and to their YouTube channel, so make sure you subscribe to the ITTF. And now, we're just going to hear a few more of my thoughts on pressure. Yeah, so pressure is a funny thing, Alois. I remember when I was young, I didn't think too much about pressure. And I didn't even know a lot about sports psychology, but I remember someone telling me that pressure is something you put on yourself. And I think that helped me a lot. So when I was younger, I didn't feel much pressure. I just went out and played and, you know, just tried to do my best. And um, maybe I was just oblivious to it all, but um, <laughs> so I remember, you know, I played my first under 15 national championships and I ended up winning that and, you know, it was a really close game. I was actually, uh, it was a best of three in the final. I lost the first game pretty comfortably, won the second pretty comfortably and I was up 2016 in the final and had four match points. And um, I lost all four points, but I remember just at 20 all thinking, no, it's all right, I just got to win the next point. And I, I won that point, was up 21-20, and then lost the next, so I'd already had five match points. But I didn't really feel the pressure, I was like, I just need to keep winning points. And I ended up winning 23-21, and that was, you know, my first national title, so things went well. But it wasn't until I got a lot older that um, I started to feel the pressure more. And that's probably when I should have worked a lot more on my sports psychology. I remember some games, um, yeah, getting nervous. Um, one that stands out in my mind was in a singles match at uh, the Australian Championships uh, in the seniors. I played really well in the teens event and was in good form. And I was playing up against a player I hadn't beaten for a while. And I did, I just got really nervous. And as the match wore on, Kind of like you saw with Hao Shui, 
I just got worse and worse. And, um, you know, I remember the last point thinking, I was down just match point and had to serve short to try and keep the player out, but I couldn't even keep the player out. I couldn't serve short. So nervous, they tossed in the ball, I lost the match. And yeah, that was really, really disappointing. Pressure affects everyone, both physically and mentally. What's important is that you start to recognise those signs and have ways to deal with it. Our tip of the week this week is what is a pre-point routine and how do you set one up? Do you wonder what people are doing when they're wandering around the back of the court, bouncing the ball, perhaps taking a few extra seconds and then coming and bouncing the ball on the table? This is often part of a player's pre-point routine. So what is a pre-point routine? It's just a routine that players will establish for themselves that they will do between each point that they play. So for some players, it'll be to wander around at the back of the court, take a certain number of bounces on the, on the floor perhaps. They might also take a deep breath while they're doing that. So that's what they're doing. They're just buying themselves a little bit of time, taking a breath, calming their nerves, calming their emotions down. And then they get into their setup for their serve. What's the point of all this? It's to get your body familiar with a routine that you are used to, both in practice and then translating that into a match situation. When we play a game of table tennis, it's often in a different environment and each situation becomes a little bit different. You're playing a different opponent, you're playing a different type of game, you're playing a different style. So what we're trying to establish is something that's familiar to yourself. That routine then becomes that thing that is familiar and your body is used to doing each time you play a point in table tennis. You may already have some routines that you do that you don't even know that you're doing. Have a little bit of a think about what you do in between each point. Do you walk around? Do you bounce the ball a certain number of times? Do you take a breath? What is the process that's actually going through your mind as well? So firstly, try to identify those things. Identify the things that work for you and keep you in a good mental space to play the next point. But if you don't have a pre-point routine or can't identify one, here's a few things and a few tips for you. One, establish how fast you're walking around the court and how fast it feels comfortable for you to walk around the court. Some players walk around really slowly and feel comfortable doing that. Other players need to jog around or run around in between their points. See what's best for you. That's the first thing. The second thing is what's actually happening up here during that time. For me, a couple of good tips are, one, just think about starting to calm your mind a little bit. How do you do that? By focusing on one particular thing. And that could be on your breathing. So you could focus on taking a nice deep breath, which only takes a couple of seconds in between a point, but can calm you down. The next thing to think about is what is your tactic going to be for the next point that you're going to play? If you're serving, think about in those few seconds, what serve am I going to do? Imagine it, picture it in your mind and picture the type of return that you're looking for on that serve as well. If you're receiving, think about where you're going to try and place that ball during the rally or what type of return you're going to make if the ball comes long or if the ball comes short. So there are a couple of tactical things that you can start to think about. The last part of your pre-point routine is getting yourself set for either your serve or for your return. So for your serve, it might be bounces on the table. It might be 
bouncing the ball on the floor, it may be no bouncing at all, it may be just how you approach the table and how you set up for your serve. If you're returning, it will be on getting into a good returning position and then locking on and focusing on the ball before your opponent serves the ball. Establish a good pre-point routine for yourself. Make sure you're utilising it both in practice and in matches. The more you do it, the more familiar your body will get with your pre-point routine. For our drill of the week, we're going to do a third ball drill under pressure. Today, I want to talk to you about how we're going to make that third ball practice more effective. And that is by getting it closer to a match situation. You can do a third ball drill where you're doing a simple third ball. I know where the ball's coming and I'm putting the ball on the table. That's okay at a very base level. But how does that translate into a match situation? Really, it doesn't. What you need to do is to start to put yourself under a little bit of pressure. How am I gonna do that in a training situation? Let's set yourself some goals. So now I'm going to focus on how many third balls I get on the table out of three. So now I'm making, all right, so that's one out of one. two out of two, etc. So you do a set of three and see how many times you can make it. If that's too easy, then put yourself under a little bit more pressure. So now I'm gonna make it, but I've gotta put the ball cross court into my opponent's backhand area, or I have to put it down the line, or you can start to set yourself a, um, some smaller targets that you're aiming to hit on the table as well. So now we're starting to put yourself under a bit of pressure as to what you're doing with that third ball. That just starts to simulate the game situation a little bit closer. So for you this week, I want you to go out there and practice your third ball, but I want you to do 10 third balls and I want you to set yourself a target. Now the target can be whatever size it's gonna challenge you. If it's to get it on the table, that's fine. If it's to get it into half the table, that's okay. You could even set yourself a target, perhaps this big, put it on the table and see how many times out of 10 you can hit that target with your third ball. For Remember When this week, we're going back days to the 4th of August, 2016. On the 4th of August, the ITTF introduced TTX, a new game. So TTX Alloy sounds exciting. What, is, what does the X stand for? What is, is it table tennis extra? I think it's just the X Factor. Oh, the X Factor, I like it, that sounds good. 
Um, so yeah, great initiative. What do you think about this? I like it. I think it's just an attempt to do something, you know, and Table Things needs to do something. Yeah, you don't think it's uh, it's going along nicely as it is? Think it needs a bit of extra? I think at you know at the top level it's a great game, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but we need to get more people into it. Like even in places like China, it's now not as popular as it used to be. One thing I know about other sports alloys is well in Australia, like tennis and cricket and football, it's really easy to get involved. Most suburbs ha- will have a cricket club and a football club and a tennis club, and I can just walk down probably, you know, within a kilometre from almost anywhere you live in, or like a city like Melbourne, and there's going to be a club there. You're going to be able to get started easy. With table tennis, it's a little bit more difficult, so hopefully this will help make it easier for people to get started in table tennis. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the big aims by the looks of things, um, that you can play it anywhere. You know, we, we, we talk about tables in parks, you know, there's all the um, stories of how many tables there are in parks. And now, interestingly, when I go around the world, I do see table tennis tables in parks in places like Spain and, um, and other countries as well. So maybe, maybe it is an opportunity. Yeah, so TTX, a whole new, a uh, whole lot new set of rules. So one of them alloys is heavier balls and bigger balls. So that's going to help playing outdoors. Yeah, and I think that's, that's always been the really big limiting factor with table tennis, isn't it? Like if you try to play outdoors with a normal table tennis ball, the ball just flies everywhere. So with the heavier balls, it will um, steady the, the flight a bit, but there will still be that little bit of X factor of where the ball's going to go. go. And then another interesting thing is the bats alloys, no spin. And I guess when you're starting out in table tennis, spin can be really confusing and really tricky. This takes all of that away. Yeah, and that's one of the things we, we often hear from, um, from players that going down to the club for the first time, and that's the real limiting thing for them, isn't it? You know, it's, it's like, how do we, how do we cope with that, that spin? And, and it's probably a bit of a barrier for people getting into the sport. Maybe this takes it away uh, to a certain extent. Yeah. So firstly, let's just take a look at some of the other rules, alloys. Um, so instead of having a game up to 11, some people still think it's up to 21, but that was another rule change. <laughs> yes. Um, there's time set, so two minutes per set. How do you think this is going to work? Uh, that, was the, that was the one thing that just stuck with me a little bit. Um, the two minutes... Uh, is is good i think but how do you police it and how do you stop time wasting that's the big thing for me because i've actually tried this um in school competitions previously and and had time limits Um, and it does tend to work pretty well but you know there is always that kid that's gonna get that two points ahead and then just start time wasting tying up the shoelaces uh, kicking the ball away. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're up a point and there's like 30 seconds left, just tie up your shoelace, game over. Yeah, maybe you're not allowed to. Maybe you're not allowed to wear shoes, who knows? Yeah, and I guess, you know, the idea of this is easy, quick to play, so you're not really going to have an umpire, so it's really going to have to be, I guess, you know, the players just respecting each other and, and not trying to cheat like that. Yeah, in the, in the uh, rules of the rule book they've got they do sort of mention that you know like let's have fun and let's keep it fair um yeah i suppose it's the spirit of how the game is played yeah uh one other rule that i think is really good no service rules all you have to do is make sure it bounces once on your side before going over on to the other side yes i i, I do like it um which means it's going to even come up near the net here and serve you know and haven't we seen that in the old garage table tennis and the table tennis uh, uh, games at the barbecues. Um, you know, that's what happens all the time. You know, the guys just come up close to the net and do that and do the, do the serve out of the hand. It's all legal now in TTX. Yeah, brilliant. And you know, you can experiment with those things. You might find you get a bit out of position from serving out close to the net, but you know, give it a go, try it out. That's the beauty yeah. of it. Yeah, the other, the other interesting one for me is that you could also now just chuck the ball onto the bat, um, which tends to generate some more spin. But if the bats, and I haven't seen the bats yet, but mm. if the bats are really flat and, and you can't get much spin out of it, then um, maybe there's no advantage in it anyway. So, but 
that will be an interesting one, that there are no service rules. Yes. Um, now, there's a few extra rules around the scoring alloys. If you hit a winner, you get two points. Yeah, so a winner means that the other person doesn't touch the ball. So you've got to hit it past the other person where they don't touch it. And so that can be on a serve or on a shot during the rally. So um, that's an interesting one. That'll get a few people diving around the court just trying to get their bat on the ball. And, and I think it'll introduce a few interesting tactics. If you're back lobbing and going to lose the point, that's when your opponent might be able to hit a winner. Maybe you're better off just hitting it into the net and ending the point. Mm. You're a, you're a thinker, Jeff. You are a thinker. Interesting. And also, they've introduced a wild card alloy. Tell us a little bit about the wild card. Yeah, so every set you can nominate one wild card point. So um, it can be any time, but if you win the wild card point, you get double points. So you get two points if it's just a normal rally, but if you hit a winner on your wild card point, you get four points. Wow, and that's probably a set winner in, a, in just a two-minute set. Uh, yeah, hitting a, a wild card winner, four points. Yeah, so what would you do? You'd sort of save your, your special serve up for that one. You, you know, the, the <laughs> tricky serve that you're going to uh, be able to set up a third ball winner and then try to hit it away. Or do, if, if, it's, if it's close... Um, does the opponent just hit that into the net and give you two points rather than risking the four? Yeah. Lots of tactical ideas hmm, once we start to get into TTX. Yeah, so, so what I really like about this new initiative is it's going to generate a lot of interest. People are going to talk about it and um, you know, hopefully that'll help promote table tennis. The only thing I'm still not quite sure about how things are going to work, like when do you play TTX and when do you play table tennis and is there a transition? Um, uh, are people just in their garage expected to be playing table tennis or TTX? Does it matter? I'm not sure. I don't think it matters. I think, I think the, the exciting part is that it's now just bringing table tennis to everybody. And, you know, when, when players are playing TTX, they're not thinking necessarily that they're playing some completely different game. They're still thinking that they're playing table tennis. If they really love playing TTX, then they're going to start to source out um, a club. They're, then they're going to start to source out, you know, how can I improve at this game? Yeah, okay. Yeah, interesting. And um, the ITTF have got a whole new website for this, um, ttx.world. We'll put a link in our show notes so you can check it all out. But I think, you know, a great initiative, anything that brings more publicity publicity to table games is going to be good and this certainly does so well done ITTF. Yeah well done and uh, so this is you know one of those changes that I think are really positive. It's time for the tournament wrap. Well the Olympics have finally started everyone's really excited but it is a bit of a strange format, Alois, for the individuals. Yeah, for the singles event, um, basically there are 32 players in the first round. So the winners of those matches, the 16 players from that go into the second round, but there they are joined by seeds 17 to 32. Okay, so if you're seeded between 17 and 32, you don't even play in the first round, you just come in in the second round. That's right, so you come into the second round and you play one of the winners from round one. Okay, so 32 people in the first round, and even though 16 drop out, another 16 come in, so 32 players in the second round as well. Absolutely, and then for the third round, the winners of round two, those 16 players move in and now the top 16 players jump into the draw in round three. So the top 16 haven't played as yet. They jump straight into the round of 32. Okay, so then that means they would need to win five matches, the top 16 to win. But if you're seated 17 to 32, you actually need to win six matches. And if you're unseated, you'd have to win seven in a row. That's right. So it's... In one way, it's easier for those top 16 players, but let's have a little bit of a think about it. Imagine you're one of those top 16 players, and maybe not necessarily you know, the top two or three who are probably a little bit ahead of the rest, but some of those other players, you know, say nine to 16, come in and they are playing a tough match first up 
against a player that's already played either one or two matches and won those one or two matches to get into there. They are going to be so into it. They're going to be so in the moment. They're going to be so used to the surroundings, the procedures. You know, it's the Olympics. There's a whole lot of other um, things that go on behind the scenes with your, with your warm-ups, with your... Uh, uh, call room, all those sorts of things. They're, they're used to that. These guys coming in at the round of 32 haven't had that experience yet. I think it's a tough situation. Yeah, so are you saying you'd rather be one of the players that has to play the extra match? I'd almost... Well, I'd rather be one of those players, say, from 17 to 20 than a player from uh, 13 to 16 because you'd get a match uh, early up and you know, get a chance to jump in there. Maybe, but you get a match against the hard opponents. So you've also got an opportunity to be out of the Olympics. At yeah. least if you're in the seed, you you know you're straight through. Yeah, to, that's true. To, to that, the yeah, round. yeah, that is true. But I suppose if you're now in the round of 32, I would rather have come into the round of 32 having a match under true. my belt. So I guess it's just up to those players to make sure they're ready, have some you know pressure situations beforehand, some warm up somehow, simulate some matches, for example, to make sure they're ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. And so for those guys, it is a lot about that. You know, I'm not really worried about the top few seeds because I think they'll just get through anyway. I'll, they'll, def- they'll get through that first round, I think. Um, but, you know, from that, that 9 to 16, it'll be interesting to see the results uh, coming into in the next couple of days. Very good. All right. So we are starting now to get to the critical time. The top seeds are coming in. So it's going to be really fascinating once those top 16 come in and start playing. Yeah, so, uh, so our round of uh, 32 match now. Um, so Ding Ning in the women's jumps in and she faces Elizabeth Samara, who is a strong player. Um, and number two seed um, Feng Chian Wei plays Nijia Lian, who's, who's had a good win there as well. So Nijia Lian, um, an absolute veteran of, uh, of Olympic competition. So Feng Chian Wei coming in against her. Brilliant. All right. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be um, putting this up as soon as we can, but obviously more results will have come up since we filmed this. So um, we'll also put a link in to where you can see the latest draw and keep up to date with all the action. It's now time for the question. And remember, you can ask your own table tennis question at pingskills.com. Grenville was up two games to nil and 10-7. He ended up losing the match two games to three. What should a player's thoughts be when you're approaching the win? So Alloys, this is very similar to the Houshway Michael Mays match that we featured earlier on where Houshway was up, it was best of seven in that game, but 10-7 also after being up three games to uh, nil. Yeah, and and so what should Houshway have done and what should Grenville have done in that situation? So for me, it's about uh, the emotional control and the thought processes that you need to go through at that point. Yeah, I guess if you're looking at it simplistically, you've done everything right to get to that point. You're obviously winning more points because you're up, so you should just continue doing what you've done in the past. But it's never that simple. No, it isn't that simple. And, and you know, is it, what do, you, what do you do tactically? Do you do the same serve that you've just been doing? Um, do you do your favourite serve? Or do you try something completely different? Mm, they're all good questions. Yeah. So, for me, it's about doing your, your, um, your comfortable serve. The serve that you, you know that uh, the type of return you're going to get from and what you're going to be able to do on the next point as well, mm. next ball. But obviously something changes in your mind um, when you start to think about winning. Yes. And, and I think maybe that distracts you or maybe that makes you nervous or maybe that adds pressure. Um, but yeah, how do, you stop, how do you stop that from happening? Yeah, so it's about how to control that. Um, I don't think you stop it happening because it's, it's going to happen. You are going to start to feel okay, you start to think about the finish line, you start to get a bit nervous. Every single player has those feelings and goes through that, even Marlon. Yeah, especially like something like the Olympics. Um, Exactly. How could he not 
think about that. Exactly. So it's finding ways to control that. It's whether you are able to develop um, some breathing techniques to calm yourself down, to just start to settle yourself so that then you are thinking clearly and make those decisions clearly at that point. And I guess also, as you mentioned, the tip of the week, the pre-point routine can really help in this situation. Yeah, definitely. The pre-point routine, that's where it really comes into its own. That's where it, it helps you to just um, settle yourself down. So by using that, does that um, take your mind away from winning? So, you, so it does stop you thinking about that? Is it a matter of catching yourself, oh, I thought about that, now let's think about the tactics and, and that stops you thinking? Yeah, it, it, it distracts you um, in some way. So, I mean, the, the basic principle, and, and if you go through our sports psychology section, you'll see all this laid out for you there. But it's about just having that one thought going through your mind at any particular time. And what is that thought? If, you, if that thought is, oh my goodness, like I'm going to win, then you're probably not going to perform at your best. If that thought is, okay, I'm taking my breath, I'm bouncing the ball, what's my tactic, what do I need to do for this next serve, um, and you're going through that process, then you're giving yourself a better chance to play that next point uh, as well as you can. And so then at 10-7, if you play that next point well, then you're a good chance of winning the point. Excellent. All right, well, great question, Grenville. Uh, it certainly happens to all of us. So, yeah. Take a look at our tip of the week on the pre-point routine and take a look at our sports psychology course on the Ping Skills website. Um, they should really help you out. Our next question is from Marson. So Marson played a, an opponent that he usually plays and usually loses to. In this situation, he got up two games to nil. But in the third game, he played a really long point and it might have lasted 10 shots or more. But after that point, he felt exhausted and he felt like it affected him for the rest of the match, which he went on to lose. But was it physical or was it mental tiredness? For me, it was mental tiredness. You don't get that tired by playing one point. You can certainly push through that and play well after that. So for me, it was about what happened mentally to Marson after that long point. It was probably a situation where he won that point and then started thinking again about the finish line. As soon as you do that, then everything starts to slow down and stop. The first thing that happens when you do start to get mentally or emotionally too high is your legs stop. And that will lead to you feeling like you are tired, your legs are heavy because they're just not moving. How do you break out of that cycle? It's about, again, regaining emotional or mental control. It's about taking a few seconds to just calm yourself down, to settle things down so that then you start to think clearly again. And it's not the physical, it's about the mental in that situation. Jeff, do you think that was really helping? Tusha has asked us a question about whether getting excited after every point really helps us to win more points. Everyone's different, so everyone has a different activation level. So if you want some information on the activation level, go and check out our lesson in our sports psychology section. But what you need to think about is where do you fit in to how excited or activated you need to be to play your best table tennis. Some people play better when they're highly activated and their emotional level is up higher, but some people play better when they're much calmer and are more in control of their emotions. Two players that I can think of are Fan Zendong and Vladimir Samsonov. So Fan Zendong, after each point will show his emotion and be, and be quite up and about and yell. Whereas Samsonov tends to be a little bit calmer, uh, goes about his own duty, he jogs around the court perhaps, uh, has a nice calm approach. So there are those two different approaches that both work well for each player. And for you then, it's up to you how you approach that and what fits best with you and what you feel most comfortable doing 
in between each point. Our next question comes from Yap, who asks us about how to approach a long pimple push that comes through with a little bit of topspin at you. You can see there that the ball is actually starting to spin forwards off the long pimple. So if the ball is low and it's rotating forward, there's not a lot of spin, it's no spin or a little bit of top spin, you can then think about flicking the ball or even top spinning the ball if the ball is a little bit longer. But you need to remember what type of spin is coming to you. It's not a backspin ball anymore, it's no spin or a little bit of top spin. So then you need to come over the top of that ball. Sumit's asked us a question about how to deal with the long pimple chopper that gets a whole heap of backspin on the ball. If you're putting a whole lot of topspin on the ball and then they're chopping it with the long pimples, it is going to generate a lot of backspin coming back to you for that next ball. So you do need to be careful and understand that there is a whole heap of spin. As the ball starts to get heavy with more backspin, I'm going to use a bigger arm action and really finish with my bat up a lot higher above my head. Now, sometimes that spin just gets too heavy to lift it with good top spin. So what I'm going to do there is I'm just going to tilt my bat back fractionally. So that's going to help me to lift that ball over the net. You're not going to generate as much top spin with that, but you are going to be able to lift that ball up and over the net doing this. So now by just opening the bat up, you can see with little effort, I can easily get that ball up and over the net. The other option that we've got is to push the ball. So as the ball gets really heavy, then I can start to push that ball back over the net. So that one's heavy, I'm just going to push it. Now, the angle is really important here with your racket. So what I'm going to do is I'm really going to open up the angle of my racket. And what you can also do is just give the, the ball a little bit of lift as you're pushing it forward. So this angle and a little bit forward will help you to lift that ball over the net. That's heavy, and I've just opened up the angle of my racket and pushed underneath it a little bit. It's a good way to lift that ball over the net, but it's not easy. You do still need a lot of touch to be able to do that. How do you develop the touch? Doing it a lot is the first thing. Second thing is keep your hand nice and relaxed as well to absorb some of the spin on the ball. So by keeping it relaxed, opening up the angle a lot and then just giving it a little bit of a lift over, you are going to be able to start to get that ball back over the net. Get out there and practice. And remember, there is no backspin ball that you can't lift over the net if you're using the correct technique of either topspin or push. Our next question comes from Daniel, who has asked us, how do you transition after a big backhand loop? If you are doing a backhand topspin or a backhand loop and you're balanced, then it's easy to transition to wherever you want for the next ball. But it's when you really go after it and you throw yourself off balance that you're going to get yourself in trouble. So if that ball comes back, I'm basically no chance. Have a look at my position now. So my left leg's gone forward, my right leg's back, my balance is all over the place. If that next ball comes back to me, I'm in all sorts of trouble. Too difficult. How do we make this better? We need to be in a balanced position. How do you do that? By 
remaining nice and balanced with your legs, so feet further apart, making sure your knees are bent and you're down in a lower position. But then how do we generate the same type of speed that we're looking for? That is gonna come from your wrist and your forearm here, rather than the full body motion and even trying to get too side on because once you get side on, then you're basically committed and if the ball comes back, you're in all sorts of trouble. So remain balanced and try to generate the speed and the power from your wrist and your forearm. And now it's time for Ping Skiller Mail, where we read out your feedback on last week's show. So last week's show, Alloys generated a bit of controversy over subtitles. Um, the auto captions by YouTube for some reason weren't appearing. Um, so if anyone out there wants to help with subtitles, get in contact with us. Um, there's a way through YouTube now that um, viewers can contribute to subtitles. So if you're interested in doing that, by all means, contact us. Just go to the contact us page on the Ping Skills website. It's probably the easiest way. Um, yeah, we do like to have subtitles, but you know, on a long show, it does take a long time to generate them. So uh, yeah, so most of the time on the longer shows, we you know we just let the auto captions do it, do their work, and uh, we concentrate on making more videos. Um, but we did have a, a couple of other nice uh, comments about the show, Alice. Yeah, we did. Uh, so James Soy said, these video shows are incredible. Incredible, Jeff. That's, that uh, is good words. And they must take a ton of time. Hmm, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but we like doing it. That's it's right. Fun. Thanks for keeping up with them and putting in the hours. It's, it's appreciated. Thank you, James Soy. And I'm easy as, hmm, um, said, thank you so much for the videos. It's made a difference for a less than amateur player. Um, he says, I can actually now compete with my workmates, so good job, um, glad to be able to help. Well done, all right, and well, you know, the pressure of another show is over, Alice, <laughs> we've, we've got it done. Yeah. Thank you everyone for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and keep enjoying the Olympics while they're going, and of course, thank you, Alice. Thank you, Jeffrey, and we shall see you next week. We love it when you give us feedback, so head over to our YouTube channel and leave a comment or to the Ping Skills website. Click on the blog, you'll find all the shows there. Let us know what you think. And if you've got any questions while you're there, use the Ask the Coach section of the website and we'll answer your table tennis question. The music for today's show was Far Away by MK2 from the YouTube Audio Library. Whilst we were filming this show and I was demonstrating the chopping, I hit a real patch of form where I was just getting too much backspin for Alois and he couldn't lift it over the net. He was getting pretty frustrated and then he said to me, Jeff, do you think that was really helping? Thanks for sticking with us and watching the show and also a big thank you for the ITTF for letting us use the footage from the Michael Mays vs Hao Shui match. Next week, we'll be back with another show.